a winter wonderland of aching beauty, but brutal. We're traveling through the massifs of the Hindu Kush, through the world's second highest road tunnel, the Salang Tunnel, a place of legend. It's an engineering wonder, but a death trap, especially in winter, in avalanches and accidents. The only highway rescue at this spot is Saki Mohammed. Selling chains for tires in the coldest winter in a decade. Tough stuff in threadbare clothes. It gets so cold, you can't see the road, you can't walk, and the heaters in cars don't work. These are the lives people live here. It's so cold, but he said it's going to get colder still. We've been out just for minutes and our eyebrows are frozen and my face feels it's going to fall off. Imagine if you live day in, day out in conditions like this. This is the only way to reach Saki Mohammed's home. There's no road. Nothing is easy in this life. This is what life is like here. Literally lived on the edge. Even for the littlest, with little cover from this biting cold. A home made of mud with the warmth of a large family. I have heard people died of cold. My kids recently got sick. Some of my animals died. Till now, I haven't heard people died in Salang. Even five-year-old Jamshed helps keep them alive. He tells me how they have to carry water from the river, freezing in the wind and storms. They survive with a traditional stove and twigs. And the sandali, under this red and gold blanket, charcoal burns. You can taste the fumes in this room. This year their heating costs soared, just like the rest of the world. No aid agencies have come to help us, not under the last government or the Taliban government. An aid agency did come by this month. This family wasn't seen as needy. Imagine the others. Their oldest daughters didn't go to school. They couldn't afford it. 14-year-old Zainab was the luckiest. She got to go. But then the Taliban shut girls' high schools. Such hard lives in such harsh terrain. Afghan rulers come and go. Nature's power ever present. Lise Doucette, BBC News, Salang. And as I said, that was our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, uh, with that report. And Lise has also been speaking to Afghanistan's acting minister of disaster management, Mullah Mohammed Abbas Akhund, uh, about that edict uh, that the Taliban imposed banning female aid workers uh, from working with aid agencies. She asked uh, him about the challenges that that poses to uh, families like the one that you've just seen there uh, in Lise's film. He remains adamant that uh, women should not be working in aid agencies. Have a listen. Most of the people who lost their lives to the cold were shepherds or people living in rural areas. They didn't have access to health care. We are concerned about those who are still living in mountain regions, shepherds with livestock and families. In Afghanistan, most of the roads which pass through the mountains have been closed due to snow. Cars have got stuck there and passengers have died in the freezing temperatures. You saw personally during last year's earthquake how Afghan women played a major role in helping 
the women who needed help. Isn't this new Taliban edict preventing women from working in aid sectors going to create problems for you? In our society, the man is responsible for supporting his household, for providing for women in his family. We don't see any problem if you don't deal directly with women, because our main concern is the family. We provide assistance to them, and the head of the household tells us how many people live there, how many people need help. But do you think it is important to include Afghan women in your responses to the disasters affecting Afghan men, women, families? Men are already working with us in the rescue efforts, and there is no need for women to work with us. The United Nations and the other aid agencies say that if Afghan women cannot work as part of the aid effort, they may need to stop their aid to Afghanistan that you desperately need. Would you be willing to discuss the issue then? This is an act of cruelty carried out by the United Nations, and it's unacceptable. In the UN, there is a law that says respect should be shown to all people in all religions. Our religion does not allow women to work in that way. So why does the UN speak against our religious beliefs? And, and, and they say to you that you should respect international law and the humanitarian principles of the aid agencies. We respect them, but they don't respect us. International law says you should respect our Islamic culture. You should respect all religions. Why are they interfering in our religious affairs?